Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar titled The Formation of an International Collaborative Network to Find COVID-19 Therapeutics. This webinar is part of the Coronavirus Virtual Event Series. And I'm Susie Valdez of LabRoots and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots. So let's get started. Before we begin, I want to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the ask a question box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have any trouble seeing or hearing this presentation, just click on that ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits tab located on the top right corner of your presentation window and follow the process to obtain those credits. Without further ado, I now present today's speakers. First up will be Nevin Krogan. Dr. Krogan is a professor of cellular and molecular pharmacology at UCSF, principal investigator at Gladstone Institute of Data Science and Biotechnology, and the director of the Quantitative Bioscience Institute. And then following Nevin will be Jacqueline Fabius, and she is the chief operating officer at the Quantitative Bioscience Institute. Welcome to both of you. Nevin, you may begin your presentation. Welcome, sir. All right, thank you, um, Susie, and um, I'd like to thank LabRoots for giving us this uh, opportunity to present uh, on our work uh, with uh, SARS-CoV-2 and uh, COVID-19. Uh, we're going to be discussing um, the background and um, the work that's been done at the Quantitative Biosciences Institute over the last uh, several years and show you how we why we were so well prepared to respond uh, to this particular uh, pandemic. And Jacqueline is going to focus on that aspect uh, during her part of the presentation. And I'm going to focus more on some of the science that's been on the context of the QCRG, the QBI coronavirus um, research uh, group. So just to give you a little bit of scientific background of the Quantitative Biosciences Institute and, and a lot of the research that I am personally involved in, what we really try to do is to develop and use in an integrative way a number of different uh, technologies uh, and focus them in a disease agnostic way on a variety of different disease areas in an attempt to get at the underlying biology behind these disease areas and in an attempt also to identify novel therapeutic strategies. So as you can see in the Venn diagram there in um, blue, we're heavily involved in studying protein, protein interactions and post translational modifications using mass spectrometry. We try to merge that information together with more functional data, uh, genetics uh, data in uh, pink, and we're doing a lot of CRISPR-based uh, uh, genetics and genetic interaction analysis, which I'll be talking about. We're also now heavily involved in um, a structural analysis of proteins and protein complexes, both uh, computational and experimental, with a large focus now on uh, cryo-EM, as you're going to hear about. And then we also try to merge together different chemoinformatics and chemical biology uh, approaches as well. Uh, so we're trying to put all these different tools together in an integrative way. Um, and you can think of about it as in a pipeline or almost like a gun, and you can point the gun at pretty much anything, any organism, uh, any uh, disease area. And uh, we've focused on uh, several disease areas um, by focusing this pipeline uh, on them in the formation of these different initiatives. Uh, so one big focus is on cancer. Um, there at the, the top on the right to the Cancer Cell Map Initiative. We're also um, appointing this suite of integrative technologies on neuropsychiatric and neurodegenerative diseases in the context of the Psychiatric Cell Map Initiative. And then we're heavily involved in um, using these tools to study in an unbiased way the host pathogen interface uh, in, in under the umbrella of the host pathogen a mapping um, initiative. And it's under this initiative where we've carried out a lot of work studying SARS-CoV-2. And as I said, we're heavily involved in mass spectrometry-based approaches. One big thing we do is um, create protein-protein interaction maps. And here are a number of host pathogen protein-protein interaction maps that we've generated over the last uh, a decade. 
Uh, we've been focusing on a variety of different pathogens, including HIV, influenza, Ebola, dengue, Zika, and bacterial species such as the chlamydia. And I just wanted to show this up front uh, because normally it takes at least a year to generate one of these maps and oftentimes longer. But we generated a SARS-CoV-2 human protein-protein interaction map in the matter of a couple of weeks. And to me, that's a, a testament to the collaborative spirit that um, ultimately uh, went in to the uh, creation of the uh, QCRG, which is connected to the Quantitative Biosciences Institute. And now Jacqueline is gonna give you a little bit of background about the Institute and what we've been doing over the last several years. A little bit about QBI and its philosophy and why we were perfectly situated for the formation of a group like the QCRG, the QBI Coronavirus Research Group. So QBI uh, has 103 labs affiliated to it uh, for collaborative research, which is quantitative, it's discovery science, disease agnostic, experimental, and computational. Uh, as Nevin just went into, we are, we're known for our cell mapping initiatives, the CCMI, HPMI, and PCMI. Nevin will be going into great depth into HPMI as we discuss the COVID-19 story. And uh, we are well known for our focus on young scientists as well as the empowerment of women across the board at QBI. However, I would say that we are mostly known for our varied uh, and ample events that are uh, joint symposia, seminars, and other things, other events and activities where we try to really just think out of the box. And what we've done is try to bring science to the community, not only our own scientific community, but the lay audience and the broader community outside. And so for example, we've uh, sometimes combined art exhibits around our symposia to broaden the mind. We had a arthropod born disease symposium last year, and we coupled this with uh, a Lyme disease panel with a number of experts, NIH, uh, industry, academia, and we also teamed up with USAID, who had done a specific uh, photo project around Zika and people living with Zika in Central America. And so we had an extensive photo exhibit with stories of people living with Zika, babies, and so on, uh, in tandem with the uh, symposium. Similarly, with the Psychiatric Cell Map Initiative Symposium, we also had an art exhibit uh, focusing on the brain and had a number of pieces created by people living with autism. Also, interestingly, we created salons around specific research topics. We did this with uh, a company called Living McTavish. And these salons are essentially um, fireside chats with experts. And so we had them around various topics around psychiatry and neuro neurological uh, disorders cancer, infectious diseases and CRISPR, and so on. And these, these are a completely different kind of atmosphere where people come in a very intimate setting to interact with the scientists who are at the top of their field to be able to ask all kinds of questions. And these salons gathered influencers as well as um, affluent uh, people who typically have a lot of impact within their own communities. We focused at QBI also at really uh, bringing out the scientists as real people in our social media campaigns. And we interviewed them to ask, you know, what, inspire, what inspires a scientist? Where do you start? You know, how do you see your life? How do you want to be remembered? And these interviews were put out on Instagram on a regular basis, featuring different scientists from all across QBI. So 103, uh, we've come close to interviewing 70 now. and. Uh, we're moving forward with that as well. Other fun things that we did uh, were things like cooking with a scientist. And this was also teamed up with Living McTavish, where the scientist who has an expertise in something, say CRISPR, is learning how to cook with, uh, with uh, Living McTavish, but also talking and being interviewed about their science at the same time over the meal they're preparing and eventually eating. And so this was a quite dynamic sort of uh, interaction where people could ask live questions as we went along. We have a QBI fellowship and currently our fellow is Clement Verba, who will play a role in the story that Nevin's going to be telling you about the QCRG. 
The QBI Fellowship identifies promising standout candidates to speed up their career from graduate student to independent PI. It's a two-year fellowship where they are granted office space, a small amount of lab space, and funding to essentially prosper. Um, and so, Klim, uh, you'll be hearing a lot more about his science further down um, our presentation. But interestingly, in addition to working with CryOEM and so on, Klim also led a number of uh, very successful hackathons around scientific imaging with mass spectrometry and cryoEM, which combined industry designers and scientists together in 48 hour marathons, essentially. And interestingly, after the first hackathon, there was a paper published that came out of this essentially 48 hour effort. We also have a scholarship for women from developing nations in biosciences. This, of course, is obviously an opportunity for capacity building for someone who comes from a developing nation. However, on our side and their side, it's also a great opportunity for international collaborations and partners to develop because typically these women go back to their science institutes or universities in the countries they come from, and they become the leaders of the collaborations happening with UCSF and other institutes and academic uh, places that they would have made contact with during their year at QBI. So going, uh, going further into collaboration and how we really foster this atmosphere, we created the QBI happy hours. And these were hosted at a local bar that had screens. And each month, three labs would handpick uh, postdocs who would have five minutes to present up to, up to three slides. So essentially flash talks followed by five minutes of questions. And I think as you can see in the picture, this was a very relaxed atmosphere that led to a lot of mingling and discussion. And in fact, did lead to uh, a lot of collaborations really starting at the ground level with the postdocs and graduate students. And we were enthusiastically told once that it was like match.com for scientists. We therefore thought it was a great success. So continuing with the vision of collaboration that we have, it really comes back to the uh, cell mapping initiatives that Nevin mentioned earlier. And each of these is actually comprised of 10 PIs, 10 to 15 PIs in their labs. So you can see that each of these represents either close to or well over 100 scientists working on a specific problem, whether that's cancer, psychiatric or neurodegenerative disorders or infectious diseases. So as such, uh, we go back to remind you the cell maps that, uh, that are created through protein-protein interactions. And we started thinking, well, what if? What if in the same way we map the cells, we started mapping the world with collaborative interactions? What if cell mapping equaled world mapping and protein-protein interactions, in fact, equaled people-people interactions? So with this, we started looking at the world and where we were interacting and mapping our activity, just as we do in the cell, but mapping the globe. Uh, looking at where we were interacting with institutions, uh, industry, scientists, and es essentially everything that has to do with the scientific world. And we quickly realized that scientists, in fact, fell into very specific networks that were focused on different topics, whether that's technology, cancer, cardiovascular, uh, and so on. And importantly, you'll notice that in our infectious disease network, you'll see that New York and Paris were identified in our network uh, well before our current crisis. Uh, Nevin will be speaking more about those relationships in his, his section of the presentation. At this time at QBI, we have a number of formal international collaborations with Germany, Ireland, France, Nigeria, Poland, Israel, the UK, to name a few. And importantly, I'm highlighting the Institut Pasteur because they play an important role in the story of the QCRG. And the formation of the QCRG, the QBI Coronavirus Research Group, was really the understanding of the context of a coming pandemic and taking action. It was a rising opportunity to change how science can be done through extensive collaboration and lead to rapid advancements. 42 labs at UCSF came together to research COVID-19, each bringing their own expertise to address the problem, and Nevin's going to go deeper into that story now with a diverse set of skills from systems biologists, structural biologists, computer scientists, virologists, uh, and we all came together in a very unique, collaborative, and unprecedented way, I would argue, to try to bring our tools together um, to try to come up with solutions for this particular pandemic. So ultimately, we, if you look at all the labs, there's hundreds of different scientists associated with the QCRG. Uh, based out of um, QBI, and it, it got so big, we had to split them into 
uh, a dozen um, subgroups. And these subgroups are focused on different aspects of studying COVID-19 from more technological aspects, like looking say, at structural biology with, led by Clem Burban or Rosenberg, or drug discovery led by Kevin Shoykat and Brian Shoykat. And then we have subgroups focused on different um, biological processes that the virus is on gene on. For example, Davide Ruggiero leads the translational subgroup, and uh, Denise Fujimori and Alan Ashworth lead the epigenetics and uh, chromatin uh, a subgroup. So we have um, essentially hundreds of different scientists being connected through these uh, different uh, subgroups uh, and working together, I would argue, in a way that hasn't been done before, it's not at um, UCSF and at QBI. So one of the focuses here of the QCRG is to try to, in a systematic way, understand how the virus comes in and hijacks and rewires the host during the course of infection, and then use this information to try to develop uh, therapies. There's a lot of effort going on around the world, including at QCRG, trying to find drugs or compounds that would target uh, specific viral proteins, and that's great, but we're also trying to understand which uh, human genes and proteins the virus needs to infect our cells, and then try to use that information to come up with novel uh, therapies and host-directed therapies. And there's advantages for uh, looking at host-directed therapies. For example, you don't have to worry so much about resistance because obviously we don't mutate as fast as uh, the virus. Uh, we and others have shown that um, uh, different viruses, seemingly very different viruses in some cases, hijack similar host machinery, similar pathways and complexes and proteins. So the idea is if you have a therapeutic strategy against one virus, it could be applicable for other viruses, um, some that may not even be that related. And of course, there's disadvantages for targeting human proteins, uh, and toxicity is a, is a big issue. Um, but this is why we're uh, initially at FDA-approved drugs or compounds and clinical trials that have passed toxicity issues. So hopefully, that there wouldn't be such a big problem as we try to repurpose these drugs to try to fight COVID-19. So in the bottom left there, there's you know, about 30 genes associated with SARS-CoV-2, and that's compared to 20,000 genes and proteins in each one of our uh, cells. So the virus obviously can't live by itself. It needs our cells and our genes and our proteins in order to live and replicate and infect us. So the challenge here is to uh, try to define which human genes and proteins do the vi does the virus need to infect us. And we carried out a protein-protein interaction analysis, where I'll go into detail in just a minute, to identify 332 genes or proteins. We generated a map, and then um, we looked at those genes and proteins, and then identified uh, drugs or compounds that we thought would target at least one of those proteins. And, and then we wanted to see if any of those had antiviral um, effects. And this was a work that was uh, published a couple of months ago. That's the SARS-CoV-2 protein interaction map reveals targets for drug repurposing. You can see there's a lot of authors on this paper, I think over 130 authors involving uh, 30 different laboratories around the world. And uh, this is why we could move so fast because of the collaborative, collaborative spirit that went into um, this particular um, work. Uh, and just to give you a little bit of background um, on this particular project, so uh, back in uh, January, uh, David Gordon, a talented postdoc in the lab, um, heard about this virus, and he started to uh, size these genes one at a time. I think we were the first group to actually synthesize all of them, um, all uh, 16 non-structural proteins, four structural proteins, and then the putative accessory uh, factors. And we put affinity tags on them, a strep tag, a 2x strep tag, and then we expressed them in HEC293 cells and then purified each one of them one at a time, and then characterized the co-purifying human proteins by mass spectrometry, uh, and then we used algorithms to come up with what we said is a high confidence quantitative SARS-CoV-2 human um, protein protein interaction map. And as I said, I think we were the first group um, to uh, clone out or synthesize each one of these. And at the time we released the initial map, it was on BioArchive in March, we just tweeted out in the, the lab uh, Twitter account that we had these clones and we would be happy to send them to whoever wants them, no strings attached, no MTAs please feel free to distribute and we'll even pay for shipping. In a, in a couple of weeks, we actually sent these scenes to almost 400 labs in 40 uh, different um, countries. And I'd like to comment that, um, that these plasmids, these genes went around the world a lot faster than the virus itself. So we're very happy that we were able 
to send out these reagents to the research community in an effort to expedite uh, understanding this virus so we can come up with hopefully therapeutic strategies. So this was the initial map that we had um, reported. So 332 SARS-CoV-2 human protein-protein interactions, including 66 different proteins that we classified as druggable, corresponding to 69 different uh, drugs and uh, compounds. And in this representation, the uh, red diamonds correspond to the SARS-CoV-2 protein. The other nodes uh, correspond to human proteins. Uh, if those nodes are orange, we think that it's a potential uh, druggable target. And on the right-hand side there, uh, we actually partnered with a company called Zoic Labs. It's a company based out of Hollywood. It's involved in making movies. It was involved in making Titanic and A Life of Pi. Uh, Biz Stone, the founder of Twitter, and Ron Conway got us connected with this um, uh, company. And we've actually worked with them uh, to take our data and put it into a very interactive uh, website. So it's a very cool way to, to peruse this information. And if you're interested in our data and in this map, I'd encourage you to look at this uh, particular website. Um, we're putting other information into this framework, um, not just our data, but other people's data. So we think it's a, a fantastic tool that many people have been looking at uh, to try to get uh, hypotheses of how SARS-CoV-2 works based on uh, this and, and related type of information. So our goal now is to take this map and then identify um, human proteins that have drugs or compounds that would bind to and inhibit them, and then we could test if they have any anti effects. So in total, uh, work led by Brian Shoykat and Kevin Shoykat, they identified 69 different um, drugs and compounds. It's a mixture of FDA-approved drugs, drugs in clinical trials, and preclinical compounds. On the left there, I'm just showing remdesivir is, is one compound, obviously, that has an effect that uh, targets uh, a viral protein. The question is, are any of these other ones, would they be fruitful in terms of having antiviral effects against um, a SARS-CoV-2? Um, so I'm going to come back to our work trying to test these drugs, but then I'm going to hand it back off to Jacqueline. She's going to tell you about some of the stuff that had been going on in the background as we've been generating these maps and making these predictions. So as the work was advancing extremely quickly with the scientists, we found it very important to keep people informed and often informed, uh, because as we've all experienced, there's been an avalanche of information about COVID-19, which is not necessarily clear to everyone, sometimes a bit too scientific in, in the jargon for the average person to understand. And we found it very important to keep the public, donors, staff, government agencies, DARPA, et cetera, biotech, pharma, and media itself informed as to what was actually going on with the research with the QCRG. We have a really sensational media team, which was on task immediately, not only interviewing uh, various scientists and creating videos, uh, but also just putting out information on Twitter on a regular basis, as well as Instagram and so on. And uh, we found that the first paper was put onto by our archive and we experienced a sudden media explosion. There was, there was news all over the place about the, the findings, the paper, the authors. And as many of you who are in the audience, I suspect, are scientists, you know that it's fantastic to get uh, media attention, but it's not always exactly what you think is the focus or what you have found to be important in your research that's highlighted in the story. And so we took it upon ourselves to write our own story and make sure that the, the message we felt was very correct was getting out there to people in a very understandable voice, a real voice that speaks to lay audiences, the way you would speak to your family or your grandmother, for example, to explain something. And so we set about writing blogs, creating op-ed pieces, and making sure that UCSF also had our voice out there with personal accounts of what was going on with the research. The stuff is complicated, as you know, and so we really tried to dilute it down to its essence for people to understand what was going on and what the research was. We already had QBI TV, but with the advent of COVID-19, we ramped up our efforts to have a number of series uh, and, and programs focused on uh, the coronavirus and what it meant across the board. We were quite uh, lucky in having uh, an intern this year, Leila Shokat, who is a major in anthropology and who was very curious about some of the questions around COVID-19 and its effect on the scientific community. And so she led a number of programs around this topic. In addition, we also had some very specific and special programs like 
the uh, French consul of San Francisco who interviewed Nevin Krogan as director of QBI and Christophe Danfer as director of the Pasteur Institute about the ongoing collaboration between the two, but also the importance and its focus uh, that happened during COVID-19. Other programs focused on what COVID-19 means to the young scientists and how it's potentially changing their research, as well as how has COVID-19 affected women in science uh, as uh, heads of families and what that means. We also tried to be innovative again, and uh, to see how do we share the information that's coming out of the QCRG, which is quite complex uh, science and biology. And so we thought about the, the 60, 60 Minutes show that many of you are familiar with, I'm sure, and we did a sort of spin-off, as you wish, called 60 Seconds, a QCRG Minute. And the QCRG Minute focuses on young scientists and trainees and tells their story, focusing on their bit of what they are working on. So again, these are one of the roughly 400 scientists who are working through the subgroups that Nevin mentioned, and we focus on their science. So coming up next, a quick one minute video to show you what one of these is like. Go ahead, Tyler. Is this virus able to actually get inside of the heart and affect the cell types within the heart directly. We found that cardiomyocytes, which are the main cell type in the heart that drives contraction and gives it most of the function and ability to pump blood, to our surprise, were very susceptible. They harbored very large amounts of virus after being infected with a very low initial amount of virus. So it was um, clear that they were also probably not only being infected, but replicating and creating even more virus and spreading that affection pretty quickly um, within, our, within our cultures. So since then, we've been doing a lot of work to compare what we're finding and what we're discovering in, in vitro in these cell-based systems and potential ways to actually block that from occurring and the different mechanisms of viral entry. And we're also looking in patient samples um, to understand if there's a correlation if there, if we're actually capturing what might be happening in the live human heart. Muscular subgroup. Similarly, as advertised uh, today and tomorrow on the Lab Roots website, we have another show coming up tomorrow that I strongly encourage you to watch, HIV 2020, Where Are We At Now? The Intersection of HIV and Community Service. Because while we are focused on COVID-19, obviously other diseases are still ongoing, as is the research for them. And so tune in tomorrow. You can find us easily on our website, qbi.ucsf.edu. Click on the News uh, tab and you'll be able to log in. So what we found as a result of this uh, avalanche of information and communication that we've put out is an army of willingness that has come out of this. Nevin mentioned Biz Stone, the co-founder of Twitter, but we found that numerous people came out of the woodwork just essentially celebrating the research and supporting it very vocally. And this uh, translated into different ways of support, but also interestingly, the introduction to various companies such as Zoic Labs, which Nevin mentioned with the very interesting interactive map that they created, but as well, Benchling, for example, a digital uh, lab notebook company, which has offered their lab notebooks for free for a year uh, at, uh, for the Structural Biology Consortium. And Synthigo, a great company that we've been partnering with and collaborating with, who's been doing CRISPR knockouts uh, for the QCRG. And now back to Nevin with the drug discovery. So we, as I said before, we had um, generated this map and made these predictions about these 69 different drugs and compounds that we thought could have um, antiviral effects and we needed to test them. And unfortunately, we did not have the virus propagating or in the Bay Area in general. Recent work by Mel and the Gladstone working, but at the time in March, we did not have it. So what we did was leverage our uh, in order to test um, our drug predictions. And in particular, uh, we collaborated with the Pastitude, um, with Marco Vignuzzi, Olivia Schwartz, Christophe Danfer, and uh, Veronica, uh, as well as at Mount Sinai Hospital, uh, the Department of Microbiology um, in New York, with a good friend and collaborator that we've worked with many years on, uh, Adolfo Garcia Sastra, and in collaboration with uh, the suite. Um, in uh, his uh, group. So um, we uh, reached out to our collaborators and we sent them the drugs and the compounds so they could test to see if they have any antiviral effects. 
So an interesting backstory with this is that uh, obviously, as we were sending drugs to New York and Paris, sending them to New York was not an issue, but sending them to Paris in uh, March, April, May was proving to be extremely uh, complicated with the travel bans and all kinds of other things happening with mail services and things around the world. And the French consul called us and asked if there was anything that they could do to help. We've had a longstanding relationship with them dating back to our first annual sim joint symposium with the Pasteur Institute where they were involved. And so in fact, there was something that they could do. And so the consul in the purple shirt on the left called the French ambassador in DC who himself called the head of FedEx in the United States as well as the head of French customs to make sure that our drugs and compounds were shipping safely and making it easily and on time to the Institute Pasteur for the assays that Nevin is going to be telling you about. Uh, in two different continents that we employ to test our drugs and compounds, um, we initially used Vero 6 cells, uh, African green monkey cells. At the time, there were no um, human cells that were available for these type of assays. Of course, there are now, which I'll get to in uh, a few minutes. But at the time, we used Vero 6 cells. We were adding drugs or compounds to our infection. Uh, with two different MOIs, it was four times higher in Paris versus New York, and we let the assay go for uh, two days and then um, fixed with formaldehyde. And in New York, on the top right there, we were uh, using an antibody against NP as our readout. It was a microscopy-based readout and doing TCID 50 assays where we could. And in Paris, instead of looking at the protein component of the virus, we're looking at the RNA component using QRT-PCR and then carrying out um, plaque assays as well. So we're doing two different assays uh, in two different content, uh, continents, and I think that gave us confidence um, when we saw positive results. So, and you're able to uh, screen about two thirds of the drugs and compounds that we had uh, initially uh, predicted, and this um, allowed us to narrow in on a couple of sets of drugs that we were excited about. The first uh, set um, are those uh, connected to protein translation or protein biogenesis, the inhibitors for particular uh, process. The first one here is um, a Zotadofin. Uh, Zotadofin is from the company uh, Effector, uh, and that was co-founded by a couple of UCSF faculty, including Davide Ruggiero and um, Kayvon Shokat. And Zotadofin is known to bind to a translational initiation protein called EIF4A, and EIF4A is regulated by a helicase called eif 4H, and we found EIF4H in our protein-protein interaction map uh, binding to um, NSP9. So that led us to um, that particular um, a compound. That's actually in a clinical trial right now for multiple uh, myeloma, now in phase two. And then the other is another translation inhibitor, trinatinin 4. This was synthesized by Jack Taunton at um, UCSF. It's known to bind to and inhibit a translational uh, elongation protein called EIF1A, uh, interestingly, there is a drug that's approved um, in Europe to treat, again, multiple myeloma that targets EIF1A as well, called pledepsin or apladine. And actually, apladine pledepsin is in the clinical trial right now for COVID-19, and they're getting actually quite positive uh, results. And uh, we're actually working now with Effector, with Sotadafin, to get this into a clinical trial as well for uh, covid so translation inhibitors are one class that we're excited about. Uh, another are sigma R1, R2 modulators. These are receptors that came out of our protein-protein interaction map. We're most excited about sigma R1 uh, in that we found it binding to NSP6 in SARS-CoV-2. And there's a number of putative sigma R1 modulators that uh, we found to have antiviral effects, including different antihistamines, antipsychotics like haloperidol, anti-malarial drug, this is our friend hydroxychloroquine, the female hormone progesterone, and then some preclinical compounds uh, such as um, uh, PB28. Uh, and just to go into a little bit more detail into the assays, uh, with sotadafin and ternatin 4 in pledetsin, we found antiviral effects both in New York and Paris. There is some toxicity here that, we're, uh, that we thought was toxicity. It's actually not toxicity, it's a cytostatic um, uh, trends that we're seeing here with the black line compared to the rest. We have some very beautiful data now in primary cells showing that the Tadafin has very potent antiviral effects, and we're doing work with Adolfo Garcia Sastra with these drugs in um, mice and hamsters as well and getting very great data there. 
And then here's just some data, um, antiviral data that we see with the antihistamines, the antimalarial drugs, and the pre-compound. And we were quite excited actually about PB28. This was a molecule that was originally synthesized in the 90s to target Sigma R1. It was originally being used to, to be developed as an um, antipsychotic drug. So we're quite excited about um, PB28. And what we showed here in the original paper that actually PB28 is much more potent um, at killing the virus than hydroxychloroquine. We actually find it's 20 times more potent. Uh, this is data on the right from Chris White and Adolfo Garcia Sester's lab in New York, and, where he's generated uh, these um, antiviral plots. And you can see the IC90s here, it's 20 times more potent, PB28 is, than hydroxychloroquine related with uh, the fact that PB28 has 20 times greater affinity for binding to sigma R1 compared to hydroxychloroquine. And this was data generated uh, for us by Brian Roth, an expert on these receptors uh, from the University of North Carolina. So of course, hydroxychloroquine has been in the news um, as potentially having positive effects or not having positive effects. But I think what people can agree on, there is toxicity associated with hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine. And there's cardiotoxicity in particular. So we looked at this in more detail with Brian Roth. And on the right there, he actually finds that hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine uh, bind tightly to the HERG receptor. That's the receptor on the heart. It binds much more tightly to the HERG receptor than it binds to sigma R1 receptors, especially when you compare it a binding of other sigma R1 modulators such as PB28 and clemenstein. So if you look at the sigma R1 binding patterns, uh, in purple there is 28, you can see it's binding quite tightly. In orange is clemestine and antihistamine. So it's binding much more tightly to sigma R1 than to HERD. So um, these drugs, these other sigma R1 modulators, they may have other toxic effects, but we don't think they'd have cardiotoxic effects, at least not to the same degree as hydroxychloroquine. And at the time we did this, we could not do genetic experiments to confirm that sigma R1 or sigma R2 uh, is a crucial for infection. So, but we generated this Venn diagram looking at all the compounds and looking at what was known to be targeted by those compounds and all the different, you know, the PB28, the antipsychotics, the antihistamines and so forth. They were known to target, um, uh, be targeted by all of them was sigma R1 and sigma R2. So we do think these are key proteins. Satisfyingly in data that we haven't published yet, which I'll get to in a few minutes, when you genetically perturb sigma R1, you have a big impact on uh, coronavirus infection, confirming the pharmaco pharmacological predictions that we in the Nature paper. I'd like to transition now to the, the second paper um, that the QCRG had published, uh, and this is the Global Phosphorylation Landscape of SARS-CoV-2 Infection. It's got a lot of the same characters from the uh, initial paper. And this is where we try to identify unbiased way all the kinases that are being hijacked and rewired by the virus during the course of the infection. I think this is important for a couple of reasons. Um, there's approximately 500 kinases in our cells, and I like to think of kinases as the, the master switchboard of the cell. So if the virus can manipulate this set of proteins, it's a very powerful way to manipulate the entire cell. So understanding that would be very advantageous. And another important point here, there's a lot of drugs and compounds that target kinases. So if you could find the kinases the virus needs, you could then jump over to the, the drugs and compounds to see if they have any ultimate antiviral um, effects. So what we did here, again, it's a host-directed type of analysis, is that we looked in infected cells uh, and we globally assessed changes of phosphorylation in a time-dependent manner, T0 all the way down to T24 here, 24 hours, and we saw which phosphorylation sites were either up-regulated or down-regulated, both those proteins and actually on the viral proteins um, as well. And we could start to cluster this data and find different groups of proteins based on their phosphorylation dynamics. You can see in the cluster one, these are proteins that are becoming more and more phosphorylated as transfection or as uh, infection goes on. And then you have certain cases like clusters three, four, where you have hypophosphorylation as uh, infection progresses. So based on this information, we could collaborate with a scientist, Pedro Beltreo at EBI EMBL, who's one of the world's experts at looking at phosphorylation changes and then identifying the kinases that are being most misregulated. And this is exactly what he did to identify kinases that are seemingly turned up in red uh, or turned down in um, blue. So then we could narrow in from 500 kinases down to maybe about 50 kinases that we think the virus needs. 
And then we could talk to Kayvon Shokat at UCSF, who's one of the, the world's experts on pharmacologically inhibiting kinases. So you could walk, and he's got this big freezer of essentially um, all kinase inhibitors for all kinases. And we told him the kinases that we thought were being misregulated. And then he gave us a list of kinase inhibitors that we looked in more detail. Just to go through some of these, which we're excited about. One here is um, casein kinase 2. You can see there on the left that the two most regulated uh, uh, kinases, there are actually two sub subunits of casein kinase 2. Uh, so there's a drug there um, that's actually in a clinical trial for cancer um, for casein kinase 2, and we actually found that it has antiviral effects um, in assays both in Paris and New York. Interestingly, we actually found casein physically associated with the N protein and our protein-protein interaction map. So there's two connections to casein kinase 2. So we've been very interested in, in, in that enzyme, and I'm going to come back to that in just a minute. We also found that certain CDKs uh, were being misregulated, and CDK inhibitors also had antiviral effects, the PFI kinase uh, as well. And then we also found multiple components of the P38 MAP kinase cascade were being manipulated by the virus as well. And, and this is important because there's many kinases in this cascade, and there's a lot of drugs, a lot of anti-cancer drugs that have been developed to target kinases in this pathway. And we found a couple here down the bottom left that did have uh, antiviral effects. And on the bottom right, what I'm showing you here is we used RNAi to knock down uh, several of these MAP kinases and found antiviral effects. So the genetics supported the pharmacology that we had uh, uncovered, the predictions ultimately from our global phosphorylation study. So we got a number of uh, kinase inhibitors that we've been uh, very excited about. I just want to go back to the casein kinase 2 connection. Uh, we wanted to look at this in more uh, detail, and we started to collaborate with Robert Gross at the University of Freiburg in Germany. We wanted to see if we could co-localize the N protein with casein kinase 2. We found a physical connection between the infected cells. Do we see an overlap there? So he carried out microscopy experiments for us, and he was quite excited. He, he called me up, and he was very excited when he was starting to look at infected cells. He said, well, look, you see this these stringy-like philopodia that the virus is inducing in an infection-dependent um, uh, manner. Now, these are uh, kind of actin-related or actin-contained um, um, protrusions. And other viruses make this, such as vaccinia and, and influenza, but not to this extent. And the idea here is that they poke holes um, and uh, it's like a channel where vi one virus can go from one cell to an ACE2 independent manner. And what he saw here, although other viruses cause filipodi, he saw this branching here, which had never been seen before. So this could be a reason why the virus is so infectious. It's a, another mechanism how the virus can go from um, cell to cell. Well, then he looked to see where the N protein and casein kinase 2 were localized, and sure enough, they were localized themselves uh, in the filopodia. So our model here is that casein kinase 2 is helping with this filopodia um, formation. So we also collaborated with Elizabeth Fisher at Rocky Mountain Labs in Montana, and she generated um, some beautiful images for us uh, using electron microscopy. There is one slice there. You can see the filopodia, and at the tip, you can see the viral particles budding off of the filopodia. There's another uh, picture that Elizabeth generated for us. The red spaghetti is the, the filopodia, and then obviously the, the um, uh, yellow uh, balls or the viruses budding off of the filopodia. And our model right now here is that um, uh, there's pathways related by a couple of different proteins that are resulting in this filopodia formation. We think that the N protein there on the right is hijacking casein kinase 2 in a way that's resulting in certain phosphorylate phosphorylation events that is allowing for this filopodia formation. We also think the row pathway is being manipulated by NSP7 in a way that's downregulating uh, phosphorylation on a set of proteins. And for whatever reason, that's now beneficial for filopodia formation. So we're looking at this in greater detail. And I just want to show you one more picture here. It's, again, from Elizabeth Fisher. It's a very beautiful and creepy picture. These are like tentacle-like structures that are coming off infected cells. And the, the blue uh, balls here, in this case, are the viral particles budding. And I really like this image because it's both beautiful, uh, but also biologically interesting as well. And those are the best type of pictures, I would argue. So there was a, a few write-ups uh, of us. Um, Jacqueline alluded to some of the press that we had earlier. At the end of June, the San Francisco Chronicle highlighted some of our top, top drugs. Work. At the time, there were actually three clinical trials that had started based on this work. Uh, since then, there's actually been three more that have been started. 
And we're actually quite excited here at the top. So Tadafin, as I told you before, uh, with Effector, we're working with them now to get this particular drug into a clinical trial. So some ongoing now, we're trying to transition into clinical trials, as I've alluded to with some of our findings. We're very interested in combinatorial studies, because I think that's, I think that's what's going to be needed here. Uh, is a cocktail, just like we have for HIV. And the question is, what is the combination? So we're doing a lot of combinatorial work, both pharmacology and genetics as well. We're combining a lot of our models with remdesivir because that could be the right strategy. And we're also doing a lot of genetic work using CRISPR and RNAi and generating protein-protein interaction maps using other coronaviruses such as SARS-CoV-1, MERS, and OC43. And I just have a couple of slides here at the end describing some of uh, uh, this work. It's unpublished data. Uh, it'll be uh, online very soon. We're trying to build pan coronavirus host protein protein interaction networks, um, looking at other coronaviruses. Uh, the A there at the top is just basically a rough schematic of coronavirus um, genome architecture, where you have the non structural proteins, the 16, the structural proteins, the four, and then the accessory proteins. And what we did was generate protein protein interaction maps, not just on SARS CoV 2, which I talked about, but also SARS CoV 1, uh, C there, and in D, MERS as well. And we subjected all of these uh, clones, all these genes to the same pipeline that, we, that I described for SARS-CoV-2 to generate SARS-CoV-1 interaction maps and MERS human interaction maps. Uh, we've also done localization uh, experiments looking at all of these corner bile proteins. I won't discuss that here uh, today, but I do want to discuss a little bit about the protein-protein interaction analysis that went on. Uh, so here is the SARS-CoV-1 map um, that was uh, generated, and now we have a MERS map. Uh, as well. And there's a number of different ways to compare these protein-protein interaction maps. And just one simple way is to cluster the interactions. And uh, on the right there, I've clustered the interactions from these three different viruses, and we've broken them down here into seven different clusters. And the three biggest clusters here, cluster two, interactions that we see with all three viruses. Cluster four is just SARS-1 and SARS-2. And cluster five is just uh, MERS. So on the next slide here, we did something called differential interaction mapping or scoring to show you these interactions, uh, all three of these different groups of clusters on one particular map. So I'm showing you here at the bottom uh, left here, we're just focused on these three different clusters that I outlined in the previous slide. And if the edges are black, it means that we see the interactions in all three viruses. If they're blue, they're more MERS specific. And if they're red, they're more SARS-1, SARS-2 specific. So if you just look at the top left here, we have NSP1. Interestingly, you have these connections in red here with DNA polymerase. So we see this as a connection with SARS-1 and SARS-2. But what's, what's MERS specific is a connection between NSP1 and STAT3 and mTOR. And we're following up on these particular connections. And then if you look at the top right, we find that the N protein in SARS-1, SARS-2, and MERS physically associates with casein kinase 2. So the prediction would be that the casein kinase 2 inhibitor would have antiviral effects, not just on SARS-2, but on these other viruses as well. So there's a wealth of information in here that we're very excited about that you could be extracting a lot of hypotheses about coronavirus um, research. And I uh, briefly alluded to the fact that we've also done genetic analyses on our interaction map. So I want to briefly just tell you about some of those efforts. So what we did was to take all 332 interacting proteins that was described earlier, and we did two things. We used RNAi in A549 cells expressing ACE2 uh, we knocked down all those genes one at a time to see what effects they have on it. And that was done collaboratively with Marco Vignuzzi at the Pasteur Institute. And then in B here, we collaborated with Synthago. Jacqueline told you about that relationship, where they knocked out each one of these genes one at a time using CRISPR and COCO2 cells. And we collaborated with Chris Bassler uh, in Georgia, and he looked at um, what effects those ultimately have uh, infection. And we got a number of genes that had an effect, both positively um, and negatively, uh, here's a scatter plot comparing the two. The, the balls here are the nodes in red. Our genes that were knocked down by RNAi have an effect on infection in A549 cells. In yellow, when they're CRISPRed out in CACO2 cells, they have an effect. And in orange, uh, these are genes that have an effect in both cell types in using um, uh, uh, the different genetic perturbation strategies in the two different countries. So there's some overlap, but there's some differences. Uh, as well. Here's a summary of all the genes that we found that have functional consequences in either cell type using either genetic perturbation strategy. Uh, and um, what we wanted to do now is not we've narrowed in on some of these that are functionally relevant. We wanted to go then 
and prioritize them and look at them using biochemistry, biophysics, and structural biology. And this is where now we can segue back to the QCRG structural biology um, subgroup, which has really turned into a consortium. This is being led by Oren Rosenberg and Clem Verba. We have 60 different trainees that have uh, come together here in this particular consortium from 18 different uh, UCSF labs. And of course, like we're all doing right now, uh, this is a, a classic example of how Zoom has been so uh, in terms of expediting uh, uh, the, the, the research. And uh, this group got so big, we had to actually split it into a number of different subgroups, looking at mammalian protein expression, doing systematic expression in mammalian cells and bacterial cells. We have a subgroup on protein purification, a uh, subgroup on x-ray crystallography, a subgroup on uh, also a group focused on data processing as well. So one of the goals here is to systematically go through each one of these interacting factors and characterize them um, biochemically and structurally using the genetic data as a way to help ultimately prioritize. So now if we go back to the set of genes that we found when per perturbed have an effect on infection, I just want to highlight one here. And uh, this is the connection here um, between ORF9B and TOM70. And I just want to point out that this is a connection that is conserved between SARS-CoV-2 and SARS-CoV-1. TOM70 is a mitochondrial protein that's involved in shuttling protein in the mitochondria. Uh, and uh, consistent with that, we actually see ORF9B localized to the mitochondria and co-localizing with uh, a TOM70. Uh, and the QCRG Structural Biology uh, Consortium actually now got just recently got a cryo-EM structure of ORF9B binding to TOM70. And we have a really uh, cool video we want to show you now. So um, hit it, Tyler. So I hope you enjoy that. Uh, so here is a static picture of um, Tom 70, and it's binding to about 40%. Um, we got a structure of 40% of ORF9B binding to Tom 70. It's actually in the active site of Tom 70. Um, this was a Tom 70 structure that was elucidated by Dave Agard actually several um, years ago uh, through another project, and now it's dovetailed in here with our SARS-CoV-2 uh, work. And a couple of interesting tidbits about this particular structure, that uh, the interaction is mostly hydrophobic with 36 out of the 38 ORF9B residues that we've been able to structurally characterize, we find interacting with TOM70. And interestingly, we can go back to our phosphorylation data set, find residues on ORF9B, S50 and S53 that are actually phosphorylated. And we actually think that this phosphorylation would be disrupting the interaction between TOM70 and um, ORF9B, and this is something that we're testing right now. And we've also given this structure to people like Brian Schroikat and Andre to make more intelligent targeted drug predictions um, based on the structure that then we're testing to see if they have any antiviral effects. So this is just one example of many structures that are gonna be coming out of this uh, subgroup. And this is some of the early fruits of this particular consortium. On the left there, there are actually two papers on bioarchive that I won't go into. But just to briefly allude to, one's a collaboration with Ashish Manglik and Peter Walter, where they've developed um, antibodies, nanobodies that have antiviral effects that are targeting uh, ACE2 and Spike, and, and a similar collaboration with Jim Wells as well. In the middle there, there's a couple of more publications that are going to go online very quickly. And then on the right, uh, money through DARPA, IGI, and, and FAST grants um, as well. So this is just a great example of a small group within the larger QCRG that's having um, that's made amazing progress over the last um, couple of months. And along those lines, just to highlight the fact that we're not just collaborating in the Bay Area and at UCSF and at QI, we have collaborations really um, around the world. I've alluded to some of these. Jacqueline and I have talked about some of these with New York and in Pasteur, but there's a, a many other groups here in Europe and, and in the United States. And not just academic relationships, but industry connections as well. Jacqueline told you about several of these, including a connection with uh, Asyntego. I talked to you about uh, Zoic Labs, and we also have uh, relationships with big pharmaceutical companies. 
uh, such um, as uh, Roche as well. So it's been a, a really great to see all these scientists coming together uh, to bring their skills together in an integrative way to try to come up with solutions for um, Beginning, uh, well, at the beginning of the pandemic, there was this great panic thinking, oh God, what's going to happen to, to science and interaction and collaboration, seeing as people were not going to be meeting in person. So as I mentioned before, we have a really outstanding media team, which was really quickly able to pivot. Uh, everything that I showed you before started coming out in late March. And uh, pretty early on, we had our first international uh, joint symposium, the QCRG COVID-19 Research Symposium, which was a great success. We had over eight, 800 people in attendance, uh, and we had speakers uh, from all over the world, from Nigeria, from Argentina, from the United States, from France, just to name a few of the places that the speakers came from, all of them and their current research on COVID-19 uh, and leading to further talks among those scientists. Similarly, we recently had another joint symposium with the Weizmann Institute in Israel focusing on molecular systems biology. And this is precisely uh, to, to foster collaborations between these two groups. So whereas we have a history with some other groups, this was the first symposium with, uh, with these scientists. And we were concerned about the ability to have discussion because as you know, when you're in person, you're able to go have coffee or whatnot. And so the media team was very creative in creating different breakout rooms uh, for people to meet and discuss actual projects, which are now about to begin between these two groups, albeit the distance. Coming up soon, we have our second annual uh, symposium with the Institut Pasteur, which will focus on infectious diseases. This will be in October, as well as uh, a symposium with U um, University College Dublin in Ireland, uh, SBI, a symposium on molecular networks of cancer and other diseases. And so we're looking forward to all of these. And this is just to say that really, the collaborative spirit does not have to stop just because we can't be in person. And these are going on and still creating these great opportunities for scientists to come together. And back to Nevin. Segue for the last point that we uh, want to make. Uh, and I hope you agree with us that the theme really has been about collaborations. and and really breaking down barriers and silos to bring scientists together. And uh, I have to say, I do have problems with the scientific enterprise and how science is framed and in that it often rewards the individual and it often as well penalizes those that ultimately want to um, collaborate. But what we've seen here in this awful pandemic is uh, we can move incredibly quick, quickly if we want to, if we work together if we can break down these silos across different laboratories, like I've shown you with QCRG, across different institutions, like we've done around the world, and then um, building relationships between the academic world and the pharmaceutical uh, industry as well. And the question I have is, why aren't we doing science like this all the time? You know, why did we need a pandemic in order to um, conduct science in this manner? And I think as scientists, the challenge will be, once the dust settles on team, can we keep this spirit alive and can we tackle uh, other diseases, you know, breast cancer, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's? Why aren't we working on all diseases like this? And I think if we work like this, we'll be much uh, more ready for the next pandemic, be it you know COVID-22, COVID-24, or whatever other virus that comes our way um, ultimately in the future. So um, we gave credit to a lot of our uh, collaborators. I just want to show you, lastly, a picture of um, uh, our lab. Uh, and just to highlight a few people in the bottom left-hand corner is Dave Gordon, who worked closely with Gwendolyn Zhang, who's in the top right-hand corner, to uh, generate the first SARS-CoV-2 protein-protein interaction map that we uh, talked about. Mehdi, who's in the back, who's the tall uh, individual in the back row, he led the work uh, on our phosphorylation, global phosphorylation analysis and in infected cells. And then three other individuals, I'll just say their names here, Daniel Sweeney, Ruth Hutton, a fantastic group um, leading our mass spec efforts. So it's been great to work with them and all of these people and all these uh, collaborators. And we thank you for your attention and we'll be happy to take questions now. Thank you, Nev and Jacqueline for your time and for your important research, informative presentation. I'm gonna start live 
in any portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you want to ask, please do now. Click on the question box located at the far left of your screen. Let's get started. We have quite a few questions that have already come in. I'm excited. We need a better understanding on what is a host as itself a natural host. Can you help us with that? I'm, I'm sorry, Susie, you're breaking up a little bit there. Is Can can you repeat that question? I said the question that they have is we need a better understanding of what is host as itself and natural host. Which, which can you tell me what number that question is? I'm sorry. I, I, um... Number two. I just put it in our presenter chat, Nevin. Okay. What is a host, Nevin? We need a better understanding of what is a host as itself and natural host. Um, I, I think that's in line with, you know, the vision of what we talked about today. And a lot of time people just want to focus on the pathogen, but the pathogen needs our genes and our proteins in, in order to infect us. So a better understanding of the host, I think, would reveal secrets that we could ultimately exploit in um, coming up with novel uh, uh, therapies. And, you know, along those same lines, um, what we're starting to do now is to study um, this virus in other hosts. As we all know, it, it ultimately came from a bat, SARS-CoV-2, as did SARS-CoV-1. So we're working with Adolfo uh, Garcia Sastra to generate um, bat uh, SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2 protein-protein interaction maps and trying to use those maps to help inform, you know, why and these live in a reservoir in these bats, and why are they so problematic in us? So I think studying these viruses across the different hosts will be very informative in terms of coming up, hopefully, with, with new strategies uh, going forward. Thank you so much, Devin. And I want to thank our audience for these great questions coming in. Are vitro testing antibodies disqualified for COVID treatment? Uh, which number was that, Susie? Put it in our chat. It's in the presenter Number chat, seven. Nevin. Okay. Are in vitro enhancing antibodies disqualified for COVID treatment? And we've gone ahead and put it in the chat for you to help you out right there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's there's there's a lot of work ongoing um, with respect to antibodies. I briefly alluded to. A couple of efforts that came out of the QCRG, one led by Ashish uh, Manglik and, and Peter Walter, where they have nanobodies that they've developed that are very, very potent in the in vitro setting. And now the challenge is to see, you know, can you get these antibodies in individuals uh, to, to, to you know, potentially have any therapeutic value? There's a number of groups that have ident identified very powerful antibodies in an in vitro setting, and, and it remains to be seen if it could be translated into having an effect in in us to have any antiviral effects but it's i think it's a fantastic strategy a biological strategy to inhibit the virus and you know we talked a lot about coming up with drugs and compounds to inhibit the virus you can come up with biological strategies using antibodies and there's a lot of work i'm going a lot of the work qcrg has been dedicated to that as well so taking multiple lines here to try to combat this virus is going to be crucial and maybe it'll be a combination of a biologic with a, a drug or a compound that could be the cocktail. Uh, we'll have to just wait and see. But I'm happy a lot of people, a lot of smart people are working on this problem. So it gives me hope that we'll come up with, you with one of these. Thank you so much. What are the major differences between SARS-2 in 2003 and COVID-19? Could you put that question in the chat, please? It's in the chat. Yep. I assume you're saying, what is the difference between SARS-1 in 2003 and then uh, COVID-19? Um, um, you know, we're, one major difference here is that obviously SARS-1 was at a much higher mortality rate, uh, but it, was, um, it didn't spread as easily. And in that way, compared to SARS-CoV-2, and in that way, I think it was easier to get under control. The problem with SARS-CoV-2 is it spread so easily. Mortality rate's lower, but it spread so easily, and there's so many people that are asymptomatic. That's why it's so hard to get under control. I think compared to SARS-CoV-1. So we're studying it at a molecular level. So I briefly showed our SARS-CoV-1 map, the protein interaction map, and compared it to SARS-CoV-2. It's very similar 
Um, and But there are differences, and we're trying to use our suite of integrated tools to look at those differences. They're both experimental and computational tools to try to get a, a better insight of, you know, why do these viruses behave differently? Why was SARS-CoV-1 have higher mortality, less infectious compared to SARS-CoV-2? And we have some interesting threads um, that we've identified, and now the challenge is to test them in cells, in um, animal models, and then ultimately test our predictions at a clinical setting as well. So um, we're working on it using the tools we have, and we have some interesting leads. And I think at a molecular level, we'll have some very interesting things to report in the very near future. Thank you so much. Our next question is, is there any neurological impact of SARS-CoV-2 as in MERS virus? Um, well, I'm not, obviously I'm not a clinician here, but I think a lot of people know that there's been a lot of neurological um, problem being reported, um, and these could be long term. The virus hasn't been along, uh, around long enough for us to know how long term these neurological issues could um, uh, could be. So um, the answer is yes, and it's not just neurological, but there's heart issues. There's, it seems like this virus gets into um, a lot of different organs and causes a lot of different problems. And this is another reason why it's so hard to get it under control. So. I think we're just scratching the surface in terms of understanding the, neuro the neurological uh, impact um, that we'll have uh, with respect to SARS-CoV-2. In, in that regard, at least from our angle, what we've been doing is starting to generate these maps in different cell types, in, in cardiomyocytes. We're starting to do this in neurons now, so it'll be very interesting at a molecular level to see the differences, and maybe we can you know, say something intelligent about um, the protein or the gene level of why we're seeing um, all these organs being impinged upon, and hopefully we can start to make some important hypotheses about differences that we see when we go from organ to organ. Thank you so much. And Nevin, does the affinity to the ACE2 receptor have to do with the difference between um, infecticity or of the two SARS, for example, COVID viruses? I think, yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think there's gonna be a number of uh, different reasons of why um, we see different, um, uh, you know, rates of infection bet between SARS-CoV-1 and SARS-CoV-2. That definitely could be one. Um, but I think what we need is a more systematic study of, of not just looking at, you know, ACE2 and Spike, but looking at the entire repertoire of con connections between all the human proteins and all the viral proteins in order to make uh, kind of a more global, unbiased assessment of, of why we see these differences between these different viruses. And so we're on the trail as are many other groups and we're collaborating with a lot of groups as well to kind of uh, suss all that out. Thank you so much. In view of the sequence homology, do neutralizing antibodies towards SARS-CoV-1 and or MERS have neutralizing activity against SARS-CoV-2? I mean, that's a great question. I don't think we know the answer. I don't think we know the answer to that. Um, as of um, yet, um, I mean, the, the, if you can focus, I mean, the whole logic here, one of the logics that I presented early on is if you can focus on biology that's observed across SARS-1, SARS-2, MERS, and other coronaviruses, if you can um, focus on the commonalities in terms of coming up with a strategy, uh, be it either chemical or, or biologic, the idea is that it would be hopefully applicable for SARS-3 as well. So all the information that's being generated across the board, across all these coronavirus, um, uh, looking for these commonalities, the goal is hopefully we would come up with a strategy that would be pan coronavirus and would be better prepared for the next pandemic, um, the next coronavirus pandemic, because, because we all know it's coming. Thank you very much. And again, I wanna thank our audience for these great questions. This next question is a two-part question. How long will studies take to determine whether prior infection confers immunity and for how long? And the second part of that is there are numerous individuals who believe they had SARS-CoV-2 in late fall, early winter 2019. Isn't it possible that there was a different strain or mutation at that time? Um, so this is talking about the immune response, um, and you know this, as a caveat, this is not my area of expertise, but I can tell you my opinion on this. Um, so um, my feeling is the jury's still out. 
in terms of how much immunity one gets when they've been infected with SARS-CoV-2. There's been a couple, there's been two cases reported that people have been in, in, infected again. Um, but I just think more data is required in order to make those um, uh, type of um, uh, statement. Um, in terms of the second part, the mutations, you know, I don't think this virus has mutated quick enough. There's been like one mutation reported in, I guess, the spike protein that there was a paper from a cell from the Scripps Institute saying that um, this mutation made it more infectious, but not more problematic, not with a higher mortality rate. Um, but I, I just, I don't think this virus has mutated enough for it to be, uh, to have that concerns. The question would be, will this be like influenza? Will every year you're going to have to deal with another virus that's 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 been different i mean one of the things that you can say between flu and coronavirus is that the proofreading enzymes associated with coronavirus are five times more efficient than the proofreading enzymes that are associated with influenza and that's that would say that it mutates a lot less than influenza so uh, the hope would be as we come up with a strategy for covid 19 that it would be applicable for other coronaviruses in the future in a much more effective way than what we have for these flu vaccines that um, uh, have varying responses year to year, and that's because um, the flu virus is mutated much more quick, quickly than uh, SARS-CoV-2. Thank you very much. Will levels of expression of ACE2 determine the um, tire of the infection, or is there a crosstalk and the other pathway becomes more active when ACE2 is low? Uh, it's, a, it's a great question. You know, obviously, I think ACE2 is a key protein here in the host that the virus manipulates to infect our cells. But I think a lot of people are focused on ACE2 as they should. But I think uh, a more, you know, the approach we're taking is a more of an unbiased approach to see what other proteins there are. It's not just going to be through one protein. There's going to be a myriad of proteins. And there's going to be a crosstalk, as the, as the question alludes to, between these different proteins. So a more comprehensive understanding of all the proteins and how they talk to one another, the host proteins in our cells, is going to be a, a very illuminating to, to get at really the, the mechanisms of, of infection. And once we have a better understanding of the mechanisms, then hopefully that will lead to better therapeutics uh, in the future. Nevin, given the relatively low mutation rate, do you think that SARS-CoV-2 is relatively stable virus genome, hence making a vaccine to homo homologous um, region relatively effective? That's the that's the hope, right? That's the logic. Uh, I mm -hmm. hope that's true, uh, that any strategy that we come up with for COVID-19 will be applicable to COVID-22 or COVID-24. Um, but it remains to be seen. We may need more data to see if that's actually gonna come to fruition or not. But uh, I'm hopeful and many other people are hopeful because it seemingly doesn't mutate as fast as other sets of viruses that uh, a strategy that we come up with could be beneficial for a long time. Now, does the QBI have uh, a common notorial study who, uh, with drugs including antiviral currently in process? And what is the general time frame, if you do, for those studies? Well, we're talking in a couple of different ways, these combinatorial studies. Um, you know, a lot of work we've done in the past at QBI have been genetic interactions, so, so um, genetic pairwise genetic perturbation studies um, and, and getting at pathway information that way. Well, you can perturb a gene with a, with a, with a, um, a CRISPR or you can perturb it with a compound. So what we've been doing now is combinatorial studies, perturbing genes with RNAi or CRISPR and then combining them with drugs to get a better understanding of you know what... What comp ultimately what drug combinations would work, but we're also doing uh, double and triple drug combinations as well. But there's, you know, it's, it scales exponentially here when you start to look at all these and you wanna be intelligent in terms of which combinations you pick. That's why I think it's so important to lay down this foundation of information that we're trying to do to get a better, you know, look or uh, generate these maps of, of, of how the virus infects these maps to be intelligent in terms of picking which combinations or or triplets of, of drugs could uh, ultimately uh, uh, be effective. And I think that's where the strategies that we've talked about today are gonna be particularly pertinent is when we start to go to these different combinations. And you need to know if these different genes, these different targets are working in the same pathway and the different pathway in order to be intelligent in terms of which combination. So that's the direction we're headed and, and we're, uh, we have expertise in the past to, to do this and we're excited to be using our tools in this way in the future. Now, Nevin, our next audience member wants to know, 
Does in vitro enhancement function of antibodies correlate with in vitro disease enhancements? Uh, I think we had, Susie, I think we talked about that one before. I think okay. that was the one that was uh, asked at the beginning. Um, okay, perfect. And how about um, the COVID-19 infection? How long will the COVID-19 infection continue as per your expectation? <laughs> well, I hope, it's, I hope it goes away tomorrow. Uh, but it, I mean, it's, I don't know, it's a great question. It's, it's, a, it's a question no one really knows the answer to. So, I mean, the hope would be that there would be some effective treatments here by the end of the year or a vaccine at the beginning of next year or a combination early in 2021. Um, uh, there's a lot of people, as I said, working on this. Never has there been a, a, a problem that so many people have worked on, uh, many of them together. So um, I'm hopeful that there's going to be some breakthroughs on a number of fronts by the end of the year that will give us a number of different op options that hopefully could be implemented in 2021. And the goal would be a year from now, hopefully we're in a much, much better position. So I'm hopeful that uh, will be the case. Thank you. Now we have time for a few more questions. Are you concerned about immune evasion and producing more virulent viruses? Uh, I guess that's related to, um, you know, viruses mutating and, and uh, overcoming our defense mechanisms. So yes, always with the virus, this is um, uh, the problem. We got kind of a taste of that with a, with a mutation in the spike protein. Um, it's seemingly, as I said, it made it more anxious, but not more deadly, which was good. Um, so that's always a huge concern is that the viruses are a lot smarter than us. Um, and we have to respect them, but then try to trick them into telling us what their secrets are at the end of the day. So the, the, the more we can respect them and, and trick them, I think, uh, um, hopefully we can come up with strategies more quickly than they can mutate and cause troubles for us. That's the goal. And I think if we, the whole message of Jacqueline and my symposium was to about collaboration. And I think if we see this as a, uh, an effort, a collaborative effort that we need to do to come together to fight this virus, I think we can come up with those strategies. But see as us versus it, I guess, going forward. At least that's the way I see it. And the scientific community has come together in an unprecedented way. And we got to keep them coming together more and more uh, to fight this really nasty virus. Now, Neva, why is it that given two individuals of the same age and baseline health who are infected with SARS-CoV-2, one may suffer severe disease and the other may have just like a URI type of kind of symptom? Yeah, it's a fantastic question. It's one we're starting to delve into. Um, you know, a lot of people, we were, a lot discussion mutations of the virus and what effects that has on infection well what you're asking there is essentially variants on the host and i think it's uh, fascinating um to the work that's ongoing now you know taking these different groups of people those that are infected with sars cov2 seemingly the same age race um sex you know socioeconomic status why does one have no symptoms and the other is on a respirator and i think there's right. a lot of effort now going on in terms of sequencing those individuals and, and finding the genes, the, the, the variants on those genes that could help explain these very important differences. And that's where our, our maps are so powerful. Once you identify those genes in those studies, you can then overlay that information on the maps that we're generating. And then in a reiterative way, you can start to make predictions you know, in the lab and then going back to the people and back and forth. So um, we've been doing work like this on HIV, studying people that are essentially resistant to HIV and identifying the mutations or the variants in, in those cases of why they're resistant and then study them molecularly. And uh, we're going in that direction as well in collaboration with a number of different groups, both in the United States um, and in Europe. But that's why it's so important to have this foundational set of data, these foundational maps, so you can overlay other types of data or these genomic type of uh, analyses that you, that, uh, uh, that you just alluded to, uh, it's, it's a very powerful way to interpret this. And this is a direction that we're headed. And, and I think that's going to reveal a lot of secrets as well with respect to the virus. Yeah, I mean, we have time for two more questions. I'm just going to shift to talking a little bit about access and ethics. Okay. When we actually have a vaccine, how will it be assured that all individuals have access to it? For example, those who may not have insurance and how long will it take to be available to everyone, do you think? 
I mean, these are great questions. I mean, this is where you need your the leadership of the countries to intervene and and make sure those that are most at risk would get it first. Obviously, that's that probably will not happen. I hopefully it happens more than we want it to. Um, but that comes down to leadership, um, and uh, hopefully we have leaders that stand up and, and and do the right things. And how long will it take? As I said before, I mean, you, know, you listen to Tony Fauci, you listen to CDC. Um, hopefully, sometime early, if not mid, you know, 2021, there is some sort of vaccine that could be useful. And the challenge then is obviously once you have it, it's scaling it up and distributing it. These are massive, massive issues, right? So. If you had one tomorrow, it doesn't mean people could get it, you know, in the next week. It would take, you know, several months to distribute it, to scale it up and distribute it. But, I mean, as I said, I mean, the goal would be hopefully like a year from now, there'd be uh, different options on the table that could be helping all of us. And hopefully a vaccine will be one of those options. And Nevin, do you have any ethical concerns about how quickly a vaccine is being developed? Uh, I, I, not ethical in terms of how fast it's being developed. I guess it's ethical in terms of getting people to, to take them and, and taking risks when they take them. And um, there's been a few cases in the news in the past week along those lines. And so, yes, of course those are concerns, but it's a balance in terms of getting this virus under control. And then it's a balance in, you know, individuals taking a vaccine um, that may not be completely uh, understood. So it, it, it is. There are certain ethical issues that you one needs to consider, but it's on both sides of this. So it's a, it's a huge challenge, and you know the the world, the scientific world, is just trying to come up with solutions that'll help everybody. Thank you, Nevin. Actually, we have time for one more question. How long after infection can antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 still be detected in someone's blood? <laughs> yeah, that's a great. Question. That's yeah. a great question. More, more data is required for that. Um, I, I think that, yeah, I, I, I would, you know, there's there certain, if you look back at SARS-CoV-1, there's studies where actually people that were infected with SARS-CoV-1 still have antibodies, you know, 17 years later. Um, you know, that's that's one case, and there's other cases with SARS-CoV-2 that have been reported where antibodies are waning. So I think, again, this is a case where the jury's still out and more, more data is going to be required to make intelligent comments along those lines, which will obviously impact immunity and ultimately vaccine development. But as I said, there's a lot of smart people working on this. So hopefully we'll get some answers along those lines, some some accurate answers along those lines very soon. Absolutely. Jacqueline, Nevin, thank you both for doing this presentation today. Would you like to provide any closing remarks before we go? I would, uh, Jacqueline, did you want to say a few things? Uh, well, I think Nevin and I will probably echo each other in this, but I think that what we've seen happening in the last six months is that we've seen the scientific community come together and have such incredible rapid progress towards a, a very difficult question. And uh, it begs the other question as to why would you ever do science differently? And I think um, we definitely echo each other in this way. If you found a way that's better, why would you go backwards and not continue doing it? Sure. Yeah, Jacqueline said it better than I could, just, just to yeah. kind of reiterate. The challenge is, as I said before, is to keep this spirit, keep this infrastructure in place. And I think we really need to look at how we do science and how the structure is set up, how the reward structure is set up. And, and now is to flip it around, to flip things around, because, you know, in some ways we have a clean slate. So let's take a few steps back and say, well, how do we really want to do this? Now is the time to change it. So also it's been a huge tragedy with this pandemic, but there's silver linings here. We can change things and we can change things for the good. And I hope we can do that as a scientific community. Thank you both again for your time today and for your important research. And before we go, I want to thank the audience members for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. And this webcast can be viewed on demand for six months up until March 2021. Labyrinths will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, stay healthy and take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.